morning and welcome to worship. It's a beautiful day. We've had some rain and uh, the sun's out now and it's all fresh and green. And I want to share with you a psalm of praise and uh, it's Psalm 36. And I'm reading from verse 5. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. How high and low among men, uh, how low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast in the abundance of your house and you give them drink from your river of delights. For you, with you is the fountain of life and in your light we see light. One of the biggest killers of prayer is guilt and shame. And one of the greatest assets of prayer is praise. And uh, this is a praise to God. So let's, let's just bow our heads in silence and praise him for who he is. Loving God, we give you praise for your provision for us. We give you praise for your goodness to us. And Lord, as we come to worship you this morning, we ask that you would take away anything that brings us guilt or shame through your forgiveness of our sins as we confess them in our hearts. Bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Ben to come and read our uh, scripture reading today. Good morning again and praise God for this wonderful week. I uh, just thank, um, thank the Lord that I'm able to come and read the word to you and uh, be a part of... Um, such a wonderful family of God. Uh, today we'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 12. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge. by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another seeking, uh, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretations of tongues. All of these are, to work, are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one, just as he determines. Praise God. What a wonderful verse. And it's uh, going to be great to hear what Russell's got for us this week. So we'll grab him back and bring open ears. Thanks, Russell. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship. It's a beautiful time of the year for me uh, because we've just had Christmas where we've given presents. And today is my wife's and mine uh, wedding anniversary. So... We uh, celebrate the gift of each other to each other. But I want to talk about Christmas presents for a moment. Why do we, why do we buy Christmas presents? We buy them because someone has touched our lives and there is a relationship we have with someone. We don't buy presents usually for a stranger, sometimes we might, but we would not, not buy a present for someone that we truly loved. And so... Uh, we buy them something, and when we want to buy them something, we search around and we find something that suits their passion or their desire or their interest. Uh, we wouldn't go around and find some, a book uh, for someone who, who doesn't want to read anything or a, a saw for someone who was not very uh, handy with their hands. And the big thing is, what do we do with the gifts that we get? Uh, it's interesting, I, I often uh, think of the the people who on the days after Christmas are handing in gifts to get a refund <laughs> because that wasn't what they expected and what they were going to get. But we've got to remember too that Christmas is 
a time we celebrate God's greatest gift to us, and that is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived among us, and of course died that we might know life. What a precious gift. And it's interesting, Jesus, God gave us Jesus, and Jesus on the night before he died, gave his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit. So God gives us Jesus, Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit also gifts us with certain gifts uh, and, and abilities. So what is the gift? <laughs> what is a spiritual gift? The gift is, is a supernatural ability that's given to you above the talents that you have. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But the gifts, wh why do we give them the gifts? We're given the gifts to fulfil God's great plan for us. Who is it given to? It's given to the people that God loves, and that's everybody, including you and me, if we desire them. And what are they to be used for? We don't take. We can either refuse the gift, we can uh, not use the gift, or we can take the gift and we can use it for the purpose for which it was made. There are problems with gifts. Sometimes we can lift, leave a gift unused and, uh, or we can find that the gift is not useful at all. <laughs> you, one of the three worst words you can ever hear in Christmas morning are batteries not included. And uh, that sometimes can create real problems because kids have got something they want to use and they can't until the shop's open. Sometimes we can use a gift in the wrong way. A teenage boy might be given a gift of a car and he may have used that gift. Well, sometimes we can reject them. And sadly, many people have rejected the gifts of the Spirit. The Corinthian church had a problem with gifts. And uh, among other things, but one of the problems it had was with gifts. As I said, usually we buy a gift for someone we love. My father, I was one of four boys, and he would always buy us the same thing. So we'd get four books, all the same title, same everything because he thought that would stop us fighting. <laughs> but, and, but that's exactly what happened here. The gifts were different, and people started to compare and work out the, the gifts what they were. Were the Corinthians Christians? Of course they were. Paul, when he writes to them in chapter 1, verse 7, says, From Paul to the church of God at Corinth, together, together with believers and followers of Christ all over the place. But Satan wants to break that line, that line of God's gift of Jesus to us, Jesus' gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's gift, gifts of uh, spiritual gifts to us. And anywhere along that line where he can make a break, he will try to do that in his own selfish way and subtle way. And so the problems with the, the Corinthian church was that they had allowed a little bit of one-upmanship to come in about the gifts. Oh, I've got the gift of tongues. You haven't got that gift, have you? Oh, I've got the gift of, of uh, healing. You haven't got that gift. And, and some gifts were seen as ordinary and some gifts were seen as more important than others. But there are other problems in the Corinthian church as well. There was a moral tolerance, which meant that there were people living immorally and the church did nothing about it. There were people who were given star status as leaders. We don't find that in the church today, do we? But some say, oh, I like this preacher, I like that preacher, I like Paul, I like Apollos. And so there was comparison and there was division in the church. And so in the chapters from 12 to 14, Paul addresses some of these of the issues of gifts. In chapter 12, he talks about the purpose of the gifts. In chapter 14, he talks about specific gifts that seem to create some tensions. And nestled in chapter between chapter 12 and 14 is obviously chapter 13. <laughs> and chapter 13 is about the love. And what Paul is pointing out is that above the gifts, above the calling of God, there is the love which surpasses everything else. And sometimes as a church, when we start to talk about one-upmanship and comparison and division, the love goes out the front door. And so that's what he's writing. And we'll just look at this chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. And I want to talk about three things in that chapter, that little passage, I mean. The first, thing he, he, the first emphasis that Paul has is be discerning. Be discerning. 
He writes and the first thing he says in chapter 12 is, do not be uninformed. Do not be uninformed. As I said, there is a deceiver. There is a deceiver who will come in a, in a subtle way, will try to break down the use of our gifts that have been endowed to us by the Spirit. One of the tests that he says there is the use of Jesus is Lord. I used to think about that and I thought, anybody can say Jesus is Lord, can't they? Well, I don't know whether they can. I ha we had a bit to do with a cult about 20 or 30 years ago. And I remember the cult leader telling us um, my, that we weren't really, my wife and I, that we weren't really quite there. You know, that they were the ones who had the true gift and they had the gift of spirit and we didn't know we didn't really know the Lord. And, and, and I said to her, I said, well, I, I don't know. I know I'm fairly ignorant. But one thing I do know is that Jesus is my Lord. Who is your Lord? And what blew me out of the water was she couldn't answer that. And I asked her three times, who is your Lord? Jesus is my Lord. Who is your Lord? And this woman could not answer that question. And so it's interesting that Jesus, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, then you know that you will be using the gifts properly. I have to ask myself at times, is Jesus really the Lord of my life? And we have to do that self-examination, I feel. You know, is Jesus really my Lord or have I allowed other things like my own selfishness, my comparisons and all those things that come in between my worship of Jesus? Am I listening to my own voice? Am I listening to public opinion? Or am I listening to the voice of the Lord? So this is the first thing. We need to practice discernment to make sure that we're, here, we're, we're receiving the right gift from the Holy Spirit. But Paul goes on then and he says, there are different gifts, but there is the same sorts. And, and this, as I said before, this is the problem that they had was the comparison. The gifts are different. And unlike my father, most people go around and they say, well, what gift will suit Ben? What gift will suit Margaret? And, uh, and what gift will suit my wife and all other people? And so you tend to look for something that you know is in their interests. What are the gifts? As I said, the gifts are supernatural attributes that the Spirit gives us. We need to compare, be careful with abilities and gifts. They are two different things. For example, a listed amongst the ones that Ben mentioned was the gift of faith. And probably you might say, oh, well, I don't have that gift. We all have faith. We may not have the gift of faith, but we all have faith to a degree. The gift of faith is a supernatural trust that goes beyond what you would consider to be common sense. And one of the great men of faith was a man named George Muller, who operated orphanages um, way back about 100 years ago in Vic Moore. And Miller, one morning, he had an orphanage with 300 children in it and there was not a scrap of food anywhere. And they said, what will we do? The cook came and the, the you know, his, under, his people who worked under him came and said, what will we do? He said, get the children down for breakfast. And so the children came and they sat and he thanked God for the meal that they were going to have and they didn't have a thing in the house. And all of a sudden there was a knock on the door and I opened the door and it was the baker, the local baker. And he said, look, I, I don't know what happened, but he said, I couldn't go to sleep last night. And I started to think about your orphanage. And he said, I've just baked all this bread. Can you use it? And I said, yes, we can. So the bread was there. And um, anyway, they started, they thanked God again. And next thing, there's another knock at the door. And they opened the door and it's a milkman. And he said, look, my the wheels come off my cart. I'm outside your place he said by the time I get it all fixed up the, the milk will be spoiled can you use it and so that man's faith was shown uh, that gift of faith that he had he used it and the orphanage was fed and I'm sure you've heard stories like that I'm sure you've heard stories like that so the gifts are something that's supernatural I think too sometimes we worry a bit about what our gifts are and what the gifts mean and it, I believe that there is some overlap with some of the gifts. For example, the gift of preaching and the gift of prophecy and some of those gifts tend to overlap. But for me, 
I'm not so much interested in what your gifts are, I'm interested in what your calling is. If God calls us to do something, he will gift us to do whatever he calls us to be. And I feel the call is the more important thing than the gifts. The gifts follow the call. And that's the problem. There is a danger, I think, that sometimes when we put too much emphasis on the gifts, we can finish up worshipping the gifts and not God. I have a bit of a theory that uh, some churches, some vibrant churches, God, uh, they, they worship God because God gives them the gifts to them so that they can be empowered to be fruitful and God gets the, the glory. The problem when we worship the gifts is that we, fear we worship the gift. if we worship the gifts only, we find that the gifts are given to us and they empower us to worship the gifts. Can you see how the thing is short-circuited? Because we don't go the full measure of using the gifts to where they're supposed to go. Which brings me to my third point. And the third point is, what is the purpose of the gifts? In the last two weeks, we've been uh, talking about who are we and, and who is the church. And in Ephesians, it talks about, Paul talks about God's plan to build up the church to eventually have the whole of heaven and earth to come under the authority of Jesus Christ. And we're part of that exciting plan. That will happen. But he uses us to do that. Jesus talked about it the night before he died. What did he say? I am the vine and you are the branches. You can't bear fruit unless you're joined to me. But it's interesting, the reverse happens there too, doesn't it? If you're not joined to me, Christ can't bear fruit through you. <laughs> there has to be a connection for that to happen. And so we are part of God's exciting plan. And that's why each one of us is gifted and we're all gifted in different ways so that we can work together as a body. And Paul talks a little bit more about that. We can work together as a body to build that up. And above all, Paul says, is love. So if we come back to the Christmas presents, who do we give the Christmas presents to? We give the presents as a bond of love because we love people. What do we give people? We give people what their passions are. Why do we give them? So that people can go into action. With the spiritual gifts, God gives the gifts, or the Spirit gives the gifts to those he loves, and the gifts will be aligned usually with their passions. And we are called to be motivated to put those gifts into action. As I said, over the last three weeks, we've been looking at who am I, really? And once we realise who we are, that we are a child of the living God, we realise the second week I talked about who are we as a church. And once we're part of a, we realise who we are in Christ, we can look at ourselves as a body of Christ and say, who are we as a body of Christ? And today, I want to look at the gifts where we can look at them and say, wow, we are part of God's plan. Sometimes we can fall into the trap of saying, oh, I wish I could sing like, like Margaret, or I wish I could do computer stuff like Ben. But the gifts are given to each of us to build the church up and to bring about God's plan. Let's pray. Loving God, we ask that you would bring us back to the heart of worship. And the heart of worship is you. Lord, forgive us that sometimes we we transfer that heart of worship to us. We want to be fulfilled. We want to be um, comfortable. We want to be um, powerful. But Lord, we come to worship you because we acknowledge that you are the God. And we are the ones who follow you. So Lord, teach us to be subservient. Teach us to worship service, the service that you call us to do. Draw, allow us to draw on your strength and on your giftings, and in that way to give you honour by the way we live, by the fruit we produce, and by our relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, 
May God's blessing rest with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Amen. And if you feel you'd like to give to uh, the Atherton Uniting Church as a, um, an act of uh, honour to God, you can, um, our, our information is there on the, um, on the screen. Uh, yeah, so please uh, consider that. May God bless you this week and may it be a time of fruitfulness as you live each day to give him the glory. Amen.